be pleased. So this meeting is being recorded and I'm pleased to welcome you to our uh, to the annual general meeting of Results Canada. Uh, so I'll just uh, repeat that in French uh, quickly. Just dire bonsoir à tous. Bienvenue à l'Assemblée générale annuelle de Résultats Canada. So begin, before we begin, I just wanted to flag. Uh, donc avant de commencer, je voulais juste mentionner à ceux qui veulent écouter au, le webinaire en français que nous avons l'interprétation simultanée de disponible. Si vous regardez dans le bas de votre écran, il y a un, un panel. Euh, donc, euh, vous avez accès au, au bouton langue ou interprétation plutôt. Donc, si vous regardez sur interprétation, vous avez accès, au, euh, vous avez accès là, à la langue de votre choix. So, there's an interpretation button at the bottom of, uh, of your screen. Uh, so, feel free to uh, put it into French or English, depending on the language you want to listen to. Um, and so, uh, again, welcome to the annual general meeting of Results Canada. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome our guest speaker, renowned global education and child rights champion, Alice Albright, who agreed to join us this evening. Uh, she'll be speaking to us on a topic that aligns closely with our values and our commitment to our, a better world, uh, which is the impact of COVID-19 on global education. So tonight uh, is an opportunity for us to look back at the past year, uh, game-changing year uh, for the world and for results uh, Canada. Even as we have adapted to the new world around us, our volunteers have stayed strong. I'm pleased to see many of them are joining us this evening. Uh, our volunteers are also growing in numbers and also in impact. Uh, we look ahead as we work to carve out space for hope and to push for progress in the effort to end extreme poverty. Before I turn it over to our guest speaker, and I know you're all very much looking forward to hearing her, I just want to commemorate the fact that June is National Indigenous History Month, which is dedicated to recognizing the history, heritage, and diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in Canada. So I'd like to pay respect to the Algonquin people who are traditional or the traditional guardians of the land in, um, in Ottawa, where the Office of Results Canada is located, and also where I happen to live and be connecting from. Uh, we at Results acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we, uh, we are all grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory today. So, one last uh, thing before I turn it over to, uh, to Chris and to our guest speaker. Uh, just some housekeeping items. So this session, as you've noticed uh, when you logged in, uh, this session is being recorded and everyone who has registered for the meeting will receive a link to the recording in their email box within the next few days. Everyone is muted. I know some of you in the chat box are asking about how come I can't speak or say hi to my friends. Uh, we, we you know, just for, uh, because a number of participants, we are, uh, who've registered for tonight's call, uh, we muted everybody just to ensure the best experience possible for everybody. If there is anything that you want to share at any time, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, or you can click on the button at the bottom of your screen if you don't see the chat box, and uh, we'll be able to share uh, and communicate with each other uh, that way. Uh, shortly, we will also have a question and answer period with Mrs. Albright following our talk. If you have questions at that time, you will go to the Zoom control panel found at the bottom of your screen and select the Q&A button to write in your question. When you ask a question, we would just ask that you say you state your name, obviously, but also where you're connecting from this evening or this afternoon. So with those housekeeping items, I'll turn it over to our beloved executive director, Chris Dendis. I love it. I like that. OK. So hello, everybody. Welcome to this AGM. It's really you know, just to get things going. It's just my privilege to open this session by introducing you to two very accomplished women, both of whom I admire. Jennifer Wani is a young leader from Regina, Saskatchewan, who I've gotten the chance to know, who is also a member of the Results Canada Board of Directors. She has been actively engaged in volunteering in her community, has already served as a volunteer with numerous nonprofit organizations. She's a co-founder of the South Sudanese Youth of Canada. Uh, she's been engaged as a youth leader and a spokesperson at the national level, covering topics on gender equality, feminism, youth engagement, and activism. Um, 
Jen will be moderating this discussion with our special guest, Alice Albright. Um, I will say that Ms. Albright is a renowned global education and child rights champion, as Jean-Michel said, and a long, who has had a long and distinguished career that includes time spent in both the private and government sectors, even as part of uh, the Obama administration. She's currently serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Partnership for Ed Education, which is a partnership that has a mission to mobilize global and national efforts to contribute to achieving equitable quality education for all. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jen and uh, to Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hello, Ms. Albright. I'm looking forward to our conversation this evening. So I'll jump right into it with our first question of the evening, which is that we know that this pandemic has caused so many challenges for us in our communities. Why is investing in education so important now more than ever? Thank you uh, so much, uh, Jennifer and Chris and uh, Jean-Michel. It's just wonderful to be here with everybody. Uh, I wish we were actually together, but this is the, the next best thing we have at the moment. And uh, I, I'm so fond of um, all my visits to Canada uh, over the years. And um, I just uh, wish we could get up there soon at some point and, uh, and, and reconnect. Can you all see me okay? I seem to be slightly off kilter. I may have a, a camera problem. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about a camera problem at the moment. Um, but just Jennifer, to th th it's, it's wonderful to get to meet you and uh, hear more about your work. Uh, the, uh, you know, the question of why education now, I think is very profound and very timely. And I, I think there's just a few main points to think about. Uh, the first one is that before the pandemic, uh, education standards throughout the world were already encountering some real headwinds. Um, we saw, for example, 250, 260 million children out of school. Uh, learning standards and learning outcomes were not, are not what they need to be. Uh, one statistic to keep in mind is that this is before the pandemic, that 52% of the 10-year-olds uh, in the world can't read a simple paragraph. Uh, and if you look at how that number breaks down to different parts of the world on the continent of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the part of it, uh, it's that number is sort of in the 70 to 80% range. So if you think about what does it mean for a person's life to not be able to read, uh, it's profound. Um, so we were really encountering some difficulties and uh, also growing inequity in education. Uh, then, of course, the pandemic comes along, March 2020, and it makes the whole thing a lot worse. And at the beginning, uh, the only policy tool that uh, governments had to stem the spread of the disease, the virus, was to close everything down. So the 260 million children out of school became 1.6 billion very, very quickly. Now, of course, that number has come down, but there are many children who aren't ever going to go back to school. And one of the numbers that we're particularly worried about is the current estimate that 20 million girls will never go back to school. Uh, there's also going to be a lot of learning lost and uh, the numbers are beginning to be estimated on that depending on, on where you are. So uh, the pandemic has taken the fragile gains that had been seen over the beginning piece of the SDG period and it has really jeopardized those gains. So the pandemic threatens to push all of us back and all of these efforts back. Uh, the next topic is really around recovery. And if you think about what does a post-pandemic world look like, we must have the human capital, the human talent necessary to deal with what is going to be a very uncertain world that will include more pandemics, uh, the, the increasing impact of climate change, uh, more migration and unrest and worse, uh, in part due to uh, climate change and economic dislocation and a job market that is completely different and uh, very much divided by those who can thrive in a digital world and those who have, are being completely left out of a digital world. And so education is really the answer to enabling people to deal with that world. It is going to be our, our engine of recovery through the pandemic and into the post-pandemic world. Uh, and then the fourth point is about resilience. I think what we've seen is how, you know, we saw it last March, March, 2020. We saw how, not only how valuable education is, 
how vulnerable it is. It can be turned off like this if we don't figure out how to keep school going in many, many different sets of contexts. So now is really the time to invest in education for all of the reasons uh, that I've talked about. One thing I hope we get to talk to you a little bit about is girls' education, because there's, it's, a, it's a problem within a problem. And it's something that um, I would humbly suggest that we all really pay attention to. But let me turn it back over to you, Jennifer. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, continuing to discuss on educational crisis, how is G GPE responding to the educational crisis? And also how is GPE making a difference um, with the educational crisis? Uh, well, thank you again for the question. Um, let me talk about a couple things. W what we did in response to the COVID crisis, and then I wanna tell you a little bit about our new strategic plan and our kind of special tools that we have on our platform to really try to make, uh, make a difference. Uh, with regard to the pandemic, we moved very quickly last March because we realized this is gonna be bad and we have gotta do something uh, as best we can. So we put together a funding package of $500 million million uh, to send out to uh, all of many of most of the partner countries that we work with. We sent grants to 66 countries, uh, averaging about seven to $10 million uh, to enable them to keep education go going and reopen schools. Uh, and that was used for a variety of different types of technology to keep education going. Some radio, some TV, some higher tech, uh, and there's all kinds of interesting uh, bits of feedback coming out of that. <coughs> Excuse me, I just had a little bit of a scratchy throat. The next thing we did was put in place our strategic plan in December, which uh, is gonna govern and shape our work for the next five years. Uh, it's all about how do you transform education systems to deliver better? So you see on my thing back here, transformer education. That's what our, that is what our, at the heart of our work. And so we have uh, reorganized all of our grant making, all of our knowledge products, all of our uh, monitoring and evaluation, all of our different ways of working to enable countries to deliver education better. And, uh, and so that's really at the heart of what's gonna govern our work. Another thing that is at the heart of our DNA is girls' education. Uh, we've also developed some very special tools um, to help us do that work. Uh, one of them we work very closely on, it's called the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange with the IDRC in Canada. It's a fantastic uh, relationship. And this is um, a knowledge and innovation exchange platform that enables good ideas to be identified, tested, and scaled. And one of the challenges in the education world is that there may be lots of good ideas, but they're not getting shared and scaled. And KIX, our knowledge and innovation exchange, is what's designed uh, to do that. We also have a number of other really interesting tools. One is what we call Education Out Loud, which is our advocacy platform designed to do uh, better advocacy at the global, regional, and national levels. Uh, we also have a dedicated gender strategy and now a gender uh, accelerator window, which puts money behind the concept of gender equality. So gender equality is at the heart of all of our work. And now we've set up, in addition to that, a separate financing window to put give countries more money to really focus on getting girls back into school and learning and staying in school. Uh, we also have a lot of work going on in the fragile and conflict affected countries. It remains uh, on, a, on a dollar to dollar basis, one of the largest areas of our work. Uh, and then we have a couple other things going on as well, but we've sort of taken the whole topic of transforming education and figured out grants, information products, technical products, policy products to try to move that ball forward in what is now up to 90 countries and territories. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Albright. As you know, um, the Global Summit, the Global Education Summit is coming up this July. Talk to us about what your hopes and expectation for this summit is. So when we, this is our, our regular financing campaign, but this time it is a summit meeting being uh, led by Prime Minister Johnson of the UK and President Kenyatta from Kenya. And when we started planning this summit now, you know, in the campaign now about a year ago, I looked at my team and I said, how ambitious should we be given what's going on around us? And there was only one answer to that question, which is as ambitious as we possibly can be given all that is ahead of us and all that we're seeing. 
So we set up some very ambitious goals. We're looking to raise at least $5 billion from the international donor community to finance our work over a five-year period. So we've extended that from three years to five years to give countries more visibility. Uh, we also have a real focus on uh, having countries increase their commitment to financing of their domestic resources, their own education. And those two things really work together, the donor money and the, uh, the domestic money. Uh, so we set some very big targets given the crisis that we know is in place. Um, we, are, we are doing this, you know, come to an end at the end of July. Uh, now, if, if you are a G7 government, if you are any one of the donors to GPE and there's uh, 21 of them, uh, now is the time to step up and invest in education. And we're seeing uh, a number of countries already uh, doing that. There's room to move between now and the end of July. And uh, the one way to understand the purpose of the money is it gives governments a significant amount of discretionary funding alongside of their domestic resources to fund improvements. Because what happens uh, in many of our partner countries is that they don't have the money to uh, fund improvements. GPE as a platform covers absolutely the right geographic footprint to look at where the education challenge is the most pressing. We cover uh, up to 90 countries and territories, which are home to 80% of the world's out of school children. So we are the platform that can get at scale at the problem in a very efficient way. So that's why donors should step up and fund GPE. In terms of Canada, uh, there have been some initial announcements made uh, at the G7. We're, we're certainly very grateful. Uh, for those, but given the extent of the problem and uh, the leadership role that the Canadian government can take uh, following the Charlevoix commitments that, President, that Prime Minister Trudeau made, uh, very terrific commitments made now a couple of years ago at Charlevoix, we would hum humbly like to encourage the Canadian government to step up even further and uh, hope that that can be considered uh, between now and the end of July. And we're asking all of our donors to, to dig down deep and do the very best they can, given the extent of the education challenge that we see ahead of us. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have, my next question is actually regarding the Canadian government, but before I jump right into it, I wanna encourage our participants to get their questions ready. Um, as I will be asking, um, I'll be grabbing questions from the audience um, after this final question, which is like you mentioned recently, Canada pledged 300 million to the GPE and results volunteers have advocated for more than 500 million over five years. Our work is not done and our advocacy continues, but how do you suggest we continue to focus our efforts um, to reaching our goals? Well, first of all, I do want, I do very much want to acknowledge um, how important a partner the Canadian government is of GPE and uh, not only through financial support going back uh, uh, a number of years, but also uh, has really been uh, a, a terrific member of our board and our partnership uh, has contributed to our work in many ways. Uh, and in some ways, we're really kind of the inspiration around a lot of our focus on gender, you know, many, many uh, years ago. Uh, so they've been a terrific partner. And I think that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau made some very important commitments around gender and education at Charlevoix that was really a sort of a path breaking moment um, for the G7 environment at the time. So well done at that point. Um, we understand that results would like to see uh, a 500 million Canadian commitment from the Canadian government to GPE. Uh, we would humbly encourage the Canadian government to consider a step up to that level, uh, as much as we're grateful for what the Canadian government has done already. And uh, we do have a few weeks left, and I think that uh, results, along with um, a number of our other uh, friends and partners in the civil society community in Canada, could continue to communicate with uh, the Prime Minister's office, uh, the Parliament, etc., to continue to make the case and we're doing the same thing everywhere right now, um, that now is the time to step up and really dig down deep and make important commitments that will shape this. We have a sort of a once in a five year moment right now and many governments are looking at this and saying, we have a crisis in education. This is a once in five year opportunity. We've got an organization that is getting at the heart of the problem. 
let's make some critical contributions right now to enable them to go make a difference for the next five years. And so we would encourage the Canadian government to think about that. And uh, funding can be oriented to our girls accelerator window if that's uh, of interest, which I, I imagine that it is. Uh, but now is the time to continue to encourage the Canadian government to step up. And that would be my uh, hope and recommendation. But we're very generous for what Canada is doing already, but we do need more. And we're asking everybody to do the same thing. Thank you. I'm going to now um, look for questions from our audience um, to share with you. <clears throat> One question here is from Claricia. Are there any startup ideas or education solutions coming out of the Knowledge and Ideas Platform partnership with IDRC that has scaled up and would be used, implemented in any of the GPE countries? Well, there's going to be a lot of them. Uh, the First of all, the IDRC GPE partnership is, is um, it's really an innovation. And just, to, just to, for those who aren't completely familiar with it, one of the challenges we see in education is that there's a lot of there's a lot of little ideas, but they're not scaled and they're not shared. And so the, the process of innovation improvement is hard fought. And so Kicks, which we are doing in partnership with the RDRC, we love working with the IDRC, is the answer to that problem. Now we've spent uh, and and it's what the way that it's organized, and this is really really interesting is it's organized regionally. So we've identified a cluster of regional partners in, you know, there's one in the Caribbean uh, in place under the, the leadership of the organization of Eastern Caribbean States and a few other partners there. There's one in Africa, there's one in Asia. Uh, I, I believe there's four of them. And uh, they're organized regionally. Uh, there's now been a lot of effort put into place to figure out the kind of the grant making you know, nuts and bolts of how do you efficiently get the money out to the right place. Uh, we have not yet gotten to the stage yet of having that money be actually out doing things and getting two ideas to ministers hands. That's the next step. Uh, and we're about to do a um, sort of an initial evaluation of how it's going so far. And that uh, information can be made certainly public to anybody who wants to see it. But uh, the program as a whole is off to an excellent start. Um, the, the actual thematic work of it is organized around uh, really five or six of the most pressing problems in education. So I think that when you look, when you roll it all up and we see the benefit of all of the grants, we're going to really see some path-breaking ideas against these most difficult problems in education. So stay tuned for looking for the specifics and we look forward to sharing it with you. Awesome. Our next question. Our next, our next question comes from Aviola. Um, and beyond funding these days, see, these days we see a couple of threats to children education, especially in regions of the global south, where where there are security issues and civil unrest. In Nigeria, for instance, news of students getting kidnapped from schools abound. The question is, how does GPE tackle these additional kinds of issues? Well, it's a very good question. And, you know, we, we are seeing more and more attacks on schools and they tend to be schools that have girls in them. And what it is, and we, we have to be, you know, kind of pretty blunt and pretty direct on it. What it is often is an attack on not wanting women to, and girls to get educated. So it's a direct, often a direct comment on that. Um, what we have to do is bring the issue out into the open uh, bring it to the attention of governments, uh, remind everybody uh, why uh, we have to have not only educated children, but educated girls and women, uh, because we're leaving half the world's talent uh, off to the side if we don't do it. So it's a question of advocacy and awareness. Uh, we also have to work uh, as an international community with all the partners that are really focused on uh, security issues, gender-based violence issues, uh, terrorism, uh, because all these issues begin uh, to come together. But at the heart of it, we have to recognize that these are attacks on people getting educated. So we've got to bring out communities to really fight against that. It's an attack. It's an attack on education. It's an attack on human rights. It's an attack on women. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your evening with us and answering all these questions. Before you go, I have one more question, which is we have over 75 people on the call with us today. A lot of, if not all of them, um, advocates with Results Canada. <clears throat> What's your advice to us as we continue to hope to see every child receive the education they de deserve? So there's, first of all, Results as an organization is just a fantastic operation. So I just have great admiration for all of you. And I, I know you guys in Canada. I know you guys in, in the States. I know you guys in Australia, the UK, you guys rock. Uh, so I really thank you for all, all the work that you're doing. The collective power of the Results Voices is huge. And so don't think of yourself as just an a single individual who can't move a needle on something, you can. So pick up your phone and start tweeting and start social media-ing, if that's a word, um, and start letting governments everywhere know that it is unacceptable for this many children in the world to not get access to a proper education. It is simply unacceptable. And that voice that noise will get momentum. It's just simply unacceptable. And I know that education is difficult. There's a lot of bits and pieces. There's a lot of things that are necessary. It is not a simple task. It is also not a task that stops. You have to keep investing in it and keep investing in it and keep going. But we have to insist on investing in education because it is the driver towards the future that we want. So we have to insist on it. And it's, it's, it's through making noise. And you guys are good at that. Thank you so much, Ms. Albra. I really enjoyed our conversation today. I learned so much and I know um, everyone in the audience did too. And I look forward to seeing what you and GP um, continue to do um, in changing the world we live in. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna invite Chris back onto the stage um, to take over and I appreciate your time and thank you everyone for joining us for this conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. I will. Um, I, I think you all are having your AGM, so I will leave you leave you in peace to have your AGM. And uh, thank you all so much. We do have, you know, just about four weeks left to this campaign is over with. So anything you can do to scream and yell and get the word out, we would be most grateful. But um, truly, thank you for all you do for us globally and in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, <clears throat> and thank you, Jennifer. That was incredibly inspiring. Thank you, Alice. We will make noise, we promise. We won't stop, we're unrelenting. Great, good, thank, thank you. Bye-bye now. Thanks so much. What an inspiring and incredible conversation with two incredible women. So um, deeply appreciative, great job, Jen. And uh, I think now we're gonna start the official part of the AGM. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Jean-Michel, although I think in quick succession, it may be coming back my way.